So I want to start by uh, thanking the organizers. Thank you very much for organizing this wonderful conference and this fantastic venue. And uh, the title of my talk, I will talk about uh, time-dependent um, non-emission systems, yeah, which is um, a subject I've also talked about in Batonev. Uh, so there will be a mild overlap, but I want to give a little status report uh, and we made some advance, so there will be some overlap, but not too much. I think. Yeah. So uh, it's based on these uh, four papers. So some are very recent. So this is my claim to the fact that we made some progress. And it's done in collaboration with uh, Thomas Frith, who is a PhD student. And uh, I'm trying to not to be too technical. So Tom will have a poster, and you can discuss also technical details with him. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I will start just by uh, providing the general theoretical framework, which means the key equations um, of such a treatment. And um, I will discuss the role played by H of T. Yeah, and I'm not saying deliberately the Hamiltonian, um, because uh, there's a little issue uh, what you mean here by the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian um, satisfies the time-dependent Schrödinger equation and governs unitary time evolution. That's here the definition uh, of the Hamiltonian. And it's not the energy operator, and it's not observable. Yeah? And I will come uh, to this and dis discuss it in more detail. And then, of course, um, there are all sorts of technical problems involved. I mean, if anybody who has ever worked on time-dependent systems, um, you know that's not easy. Yeah, think of your standard, maybe the star Hamiltonian, you have a potential coupled to a laser field. Yeah, there are very few um, exact solutions known. So in that context, that's usually done perturbatively. Yeah, so if you have a weak laser field, then uh, everybody knows uh, Fermi's golden rule, but that's a perturbative state. And um, if you are in the high intensity regime, which we are nowadays, you reverse the situation, your potential becomes a perturbation. Uh, and you, you very often, uh, what people do is perturbation theory uh, around the Gordon Volkov solution, which is a solution when the potential is zero. Yeah? So time dependent systems are, even in the emission case, they are notoriously difficult to solve, and, um, but of course, very important. So, also here, the technicalities um, will be similar, but somewhat different. And then I will, I will not go, we, we looked at a lot of concrete models, so I will not go by one model by one model, and, uh, and, and I will focus on um, features we learned from these concrete models. Yeah? So I'm trying to extract what we learn from particular models, rather than going in detail through the models. Yeah, and then I draw some general conclusions as well. So what are the key equations? Well, we have um, our time-dependent Schrödinger equations, and we have one for the Hermitian Hamiltonian, which I call here small h, and then there's another one for the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And um, the relation between the solution for the emission equation and the solution for the non-emission equation, phi and psi, are related in this way, by what is often called the Dyson operator, uh, the reason being that this framework you can find in a paper already by uh, Dyson in 1956, and many people uh, refer to this operator uh, as the Dyson operator. And it's time dependent here, yeah, so that's the key difference. And um, if we plug this in here, then we get um, what we refer to as the time-dependent Dyson equation. Yeah? So if you have worked on time-dependent systems, then this looks like just like a gauge transformation. Uh, but it isn't, because eta is not a unitary operator. Yeah? So it would be a gauge transformation between two Hermitian Hamiltonians. Yeah? In this case, it's a transformation between a non-hemission and an emission Hamiltonian. 
Now, there's um, another equation, which is the quasi hematicity equation. If the right hand side is not there, you will find this equation and also the terminology quasi emission in a paper by Diodonet already in 61, um, who looked at this left hand side, um, not having a time dependence, um, not even assuming that rho is invertible. Yeah, so there's sometimes some um, difference in terminology, but I will not go into this. I will focus here on the time dependent scenario. And this equation simply comes out by uh, conjugating this and doing some uh, elementary uh, manipulations. Yeah. So the difference are compared, comparing time independent and time dependent systems is always is, is this the appearance of this term and here the appearance of the right hand side. Yeah. And um, solving this system or solving this system, which is of course equivalent. Um, there are many, many papers in the time independent case and uh, a large number of people in the audience have written papers uh, in one form or another about that scenario. So having solved one means essentially you have solved the other. And one can ask now technical questions, um, which one is easier to solve? Um, should we start here or here? Well, it's easier to solve this one yeah, if you want to get rho, which will play the role of the metric. Um, uh, you, you, you can easily get it by conjugating eta, and then you get the rho. Yeah. If you do it the other way around, if you solve this one first, then this is the eta, to extract the eta is more difficult. Yeah. So these are the key equations. So, um, and, and the key feature here is that since H is no longer related, capital H is no longer related to small h by similarity transformation. If H is a self adjoint operator, uh, then H is not a self adjoint operator. Yeah? So it's, it's not quasi emission or pseudo emission, whatever term you want to use. Yeah? And that has consequences. That means that this operator is not observable. Yeah? So, but H, yes, yes. Which one? Eta doesn't have to be emission. Um, yeah. Usually it is, but it doesn't have to be for this framework to hold. It doesn't have to be emission. It's never unique. No, even in the time independent case. Ah. Ah. Okay. Oh. Oh. The, the equivalence between this relations. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's what I said. Going the other way is more problematic because you have to, even if eta is emission, there's still a problem because you have to take a square root and usually then you take the positive one. Yeah. So, I will come to that. I will come, I will come to that. Quasi emission, okay, maybe I explain it now. Quasi emission means in the old literature means this equation. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the quasi hematicity the definition of the quasi hematicity yeah. Yes, if they are quasi emission and you, let's talk about the time independent case, then of course it's just the similarity transformation and eigenvalues are preserved. Yeah, that's the key idea between the time independent case because you know that H, because its emission has real eigenvalues, and therefore you know that capital H also has real eigenvalues, as long as this transformation is defined. That's just the time independent case. That is well known. Yeah? So here the complication is this term. Yeah? So since H still satisfies capital H, the, Schrodinger, uh, the, the, the time dependent Schrodinger equation, um, nothing will change. Uh, for the time evolution operator. Yeah, so this is standard emission setting for the time evolution operator, which is just the operator taking you from time t dash to time t, and then is defined in the usual way here. These are time ordered product. That's the standard way uh, to define time evolution operators. And this time evolution operator satisfies also the time dependent Schrodinger equation 
and this um, standard relation hold, and then you can um, work out unitary time evolution. Yeah, that's standard Hermitian, the standard Hermitian case. Um, and also, in the non-Hermitian case, since capital H still satisfies the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, um, it's essentially the same. Yeah, so these equations do not change because uh, capital U, the time evolution operator related to the non-emission case, also satisfies the time-dependent Schrödinger equation. Yeah? And then if you want to calculate inner products, then of course we need to change uh, the metric. But that's not affecting the time evolution operator. That's just a feature of taking inner products. Yeah? So there's nothing really dramatic happening for the time evolution operator as well. Yeah? And um, they are even related um, by similarity transformation. Yeah? So um, having one, uh, you can easily get the other one if you find the eta. Yeah? And then this is a, a well-known formula in the context of time-dependent systems. This is basically setting up a perturbation theory. Usually this is written down for gauge theories. Yeah? And um, this, this always involves here the difference between two Hamiltonians and then you iterate this, this is the standard procedure, you know, if you set up the perturbation theory, you plug in the ut dash in here, and then you iterate this, and that will set up your Dyson series and your perturbation theory. Yeah? And um, nothing in this respect changes here, but now our difference is now um, the difference between the Hermitian and the non-Hermitian uh, Hamiltonian. So we do a perturbation, we can use that to set up a perturbation theory around the Hermitian case and take the non-Hermitian piece as a perturbation. Yeah? So that's called the Duhamel formula, standard uh, formula. And um, that's also standard now. Um, when you can do it for the time evolution operator, you can set up a similar set of equations uh, for the Green's functions. Yeah? So, yes? No, it's the same. No. Finally, calm down. Yeah. Finally calm down. Yeah. This equation, capital U, yeah. E prime equal to small. Yeah. Call it in this prime. You see, if the conventional Dyson equation for the Green's function, you see here a capital H is minus small H is then capital U T is small U T is. It is more com complicated than the. Formally, it's just the same. Same. Yeah. But yeah. it seems to me the more co complicated. No, if you look at gauge theories, you okay. will just have here a different H and here a different H. That's the only difference. Only difference. Okay. That's the only difference. Okay. In Hermitian standard time dependent systems, mm -hmm. um, there are these different gauges um, you, you, you can set up and uh, you will have the same equation appearing. Yeah. It's not more complicated. At, the, at this point, it's not more complicated. So then, um, I already indicated this, the key feature is now H is still a Hamiltonian in the sense that it satisfies a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but it's not observable because we know observables have to satisfy these equations. Yeah? So if O is an observable in my Hermitian system, then in my non-Hermitian system, the observable has to be of this form. This is how observables in the Hermitian and the non-Hermitian systems are related. And you remember the time-dependent Dyson equation had this additional term. So therefore, capital H, the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, is not an observable operator. Yeah. So here is the standard um, scenario or the standard definition um, how we uh, calculate the observables in the non-Hermitian case. We have to change the metric here. Yeah, this is our row. And in this context here, it will be time dependent. Yeah? So, however, so H is not quasi pseudo Hermitian and therefore it's not an observable. However, we can define a new operator, which I call here H tilde, yeah? which is related by similarity transformation to small h, with it, which is the Hermitian operator. Yeah? So this one is observable, and it has um, standard, well-defined features and properties, um, but it involves here this h, and then this additional term. Yeah? So all information really lies in the eta or the rho. Yeah? So this, this duality, or 
of the Hamiltonian, yeah, which uh, is the energy operator and the uh, solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, that's no longer valid. Yeah? This you have to give up. But why, why not? There's no, 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 no problem doing this. Now, there are three scenarios we can look at, and all of them are interesting in some sense. Um, we can have capital H and small h time-dependent, um, but we take the um, Dyson operator to be time-independent, and um, then, of course, this additional term disappears. Yeah? And that has been done already uh, some time ago. And that's um, less challenging. In this case, time becomes essentially a parameter. Yeah? It's more complicated if we switch on now time in the Dyson operator or in the metric. Yeah? And there's also a nice example or a nice scenario, a special case, one can consider, we have now time dependence in eta, in small h, but we still take capital H to be time independent. Yeah? And that's interesting because it's kind of a generalization of the Heisenberg and Schrodinger picture. Yeah? In the Heisenberg picture, you remember, time is in the observable. In the Schrodinger picture, time uh, is in the states. And here we have a third option, which you don't have normally. Time is in the metric. Yeah? And why is this interesting? So suppose you are interested in solving um, an Hermitian problem which is time-dependent, for time-dependent Hermitian Hamiltonian, yeah? then this will allow you to go back solving um, the time-independent Schrödinger equation for non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and then translate it uh, via the Dyson map to this system. Yeah. And it turns out, examples we looked at, um, that if you solve the left-hand side, it's actually easier um, than solving um, the, the non-emission system, uh, the, the, the emission system directly. Yeah? So technically, this gives some advantage. Similarly, as sometimes the Heisenberg picture is more advantageous than the Schrodinger picture. Yeah? So this also happens here. Yeah? And the full scenario, is this, capital H is time dependent, small h is time dependent, and the metric. So this is the general um, framework, and I already said, we can either solve um, uh, for the quasi hermeticity relation for rho, and then we get eta from this relation, that's awkward, yeah? but if we solve this equation um, for eta, the time dependent Dyson equation, then rho is easy to obtain. Yeah? And here is an example um, of, first, a time-independent um, system, which, in fact, doesn't make sense. Yeah? So there was always um, this kind of language, we are making sense of Hermitian operators, so we can also make sense now of um, systems which are actually in the broken regime, which seem to be meaningless. Yeah? But if you switch on time, they become meaningful. Yeah, so here's an easy two by two Hamiltonian. Yeah. Um, it's a, a one side Hamiltonian for a system we are also interested in um, because it's related to conformal field theory, um, uh, which has a C minus 22 over 5 for people who are familiar with this. But this is, of course, just a one side Hamiltonian. Um, so we, we, we don't make much statements about the chain. Yeah? But that's where this Hamiltonian comes from. Yeah? So and, but since it's just two by two, you can easily work out the eigen system, eigenvalues, eigenfunctions. And uh, you see here, um, this has two regimes. Yeah? Um, we, have, we identify a PT symmetry, which will guarantee us um, the uh, reality um, of the spectrum. That's standard. Yeah? And there are two regimes. You see here um, that when modulus lambda is greater than modulus kappa, um, then uh, we are in the PT regime, and the eigenvalues will be real. And if we are in the other regime, modulus lambda smaller, modulus kappa, then the PT symmetry is broken. Yeah? Spontaneous was used in the previous talk. Yeah, this is what people often refer to as the spontaneously broken uh, PT symmetry. Yeah? So, uh, Sorry? 
Reprints. Yes. Reference, reference of this paper. Yes, I, I mentioned my reference at the beginning. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I can go back. All the all the all is written in those papers. So if this is broken, yeah, if this doesn't hold, um, we still have a PT symmetric Hamiltonian, of course, but the eigenvalues are complex. Yeah. So now usually we throw away this regime. This regime is kind of meaningless. Uh, um, opti op optics people, of course, like that regime, but from a quantum mechanical point of view, maybe because there's growth, we should throw this away. Yeah, and the statement is, if we switch on time, this regime uh, becomes meaningful. Yeah, that's the claim here. Yeah, so if I introduce time here, then this system has a real eigen energies. In that sense, of course, I'm talking about um, sim uh, uh, simultaneous eigen eigenvalues. Yeah, it's sort of calculating eigenvalues for dress states, what people would call this. But yeah, yes, yeah. No, no. I, I will. I will. At this point, I make a statement, and I will come back and explain it. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to explain it. Yeah, just first the time-independent system. This regime would be not interesting, yeah? And I come back to this, yeah? Hmm? So maybe previous of this one, the case one, two, three was explained. Yeah. So I'm asking that uh, the, into the case two, is the vice versa is possible? I mean, the Hermitian Ham, uh, uh, Hamiltonian is, uh, I mean, where the non-Hermitian non Hamiltonian is time dependent and not yes. the, that is also possible. Yes, but this, yeah, but that's, you, you want to reverse this, yeah? Yeah, so that, if I am That's less, having... less uh, you can do this formally, of course, yeah, uh, but then um, you, you would be normally interested, what does it tell you? Yeah, so, what, so it is. It, yeah. it would be a decaying system with time, but still I yeah. can study it in a Hermitian version, right? You can do that, but okay. usually one is interested in solutions of the non-Hermitian system. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. The case I was just talking now would be case zero. Yeah, everything is time independent. Yeah. So that's this system. Uh, this is just a standard time independent scenario. Yeah. Now, is this special to this um, 2D system? It is not, so here's another example. Yeah. So uh, this is a 2D system, which has an infinite uh, dimensional Hilbert space, and it's just two harmonic oscillators, and then here we couple them um, with an, um, a non-emission term. Yeah. So there's this, and I wrote this here in terms of Lie algebraic generators. So if you add this K4 here, then we get a closed algebra, you know, with a four, just four generators. You know. That's useful um, to, for, for the solution procedure because that allows us to make a very useful ansatz um, for the eta. You know. so I'll come back to this. You, know. you may think, oh, why, this looks a bit awkward here. Why, why do you introduce um, space and momenta here to couple them? It would looks easier if I drop the piece, no, I just have here x and y, I could take this, but um, that system is actually more complicated. The algebra, which then closes, would be 10-dimensional, yeah, so this is actually easier, yeah. But in principle, this is the general principle, it's just the technicalities become more complicated, yeah. Here's the algebra. It's not a standard algebra, yeah. But it's an algebra. What's the question? Yeah. So, so I, I, I define my Hamiltonian in terms of uh, these objects, which form a closed algebra. No, it's not. You can see it's not. No. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, it's not. If you think of, it's not. It's not a two. It's not G two. It's not. If you have four, four generators, it's it's probably. I mean, that's not relevant. Yeah, and it's not obvious what it is. Not to me. If you can see it, what it is, let me know. 
Mm. So moving on. So this is now our Hamiltonian, yeah, and um, it's uh, it has these antilinear symmetries. I still refer to them as PT, yeah, even though um, I mean some very often people call this partial PT because full PT would be sending x and y to to its negative. Yeah, that will not work here. That's not uh, symmetric here. But what we need is we need antilinear operators. Yeah, it doesn't have to be PT, of course. Yeah, and these two, um, these two antilinear operators are symmetries of my Hamiltonian here. Yeah. And um, so again, we have a PT symmetric system. So we can ask the question: What are the energies and what are uh, the eigenstates? So here uh, we can map to this. Emission Hamiltonian, and you see here, uh, this is a um, harmonic oscillator in X, and this is an harmonic oscillator in Y with some complicated coefficients. Yeah? And this is the simple map, just using this fourth generator K4 here. Yeah? And you see also here, um, that will break down, yeah? this, this eta will break down, um, uh, and your, your um, Hamiltonian Hamiltonian is not satisfied when um, when a minus b modulus is smaller than modulus lambda, yeah? and especially when a is equal to b. Again, we have a scenario where this Hamiltonian would be would be kind of sick because we are in the broken regime. And again, the statement is: if we switch on time, this becomes meaningful. Yeah. So we we want to now look at this regime: a equal b. And in the time independent system, you can easily calculate your energy, uh, your eigenstates, your eigenfunctions. Here they are. And you see here it's complex except for n equal to m. But this is just one value. Yeah? So again, that's what I said. This system has the same feature as our two dimensional system. Yeah? Now, this is the claim. It becomes uh, meaningful when I switch on time. So here's the. Uh, time-dependent system. So now I'm switching on here uh, this coefficient. We are now in the regime A equal B. So A is time-dependent, lambda is time-dependent, and this is where the algebra is useful now. We make an ansatz in terms of these generators, yeah? and we know when we act jointly on this, we stay um, in this algebra, and also this term, which looks like, like a gauge term, yeah, it's a Maurer term form, so we also stay in this algebra. Yeah? So that's now a well-defined problem. We substitute this into our Dyson equation, and this is what time-dependent Dyson equation, and this is what we get. Yeah? So we need to solve uh, this system. These are the constraints. Yeah? So if you solve this, then you have your map, eta, depending on t, and this would be the time-dependent Hermitian Hamiltonian. Yeah. This is not easy to solve, uh, even for this simple system. Yeah. But if you do some clever transformations, yeah, um, a new quantity of t being a hyperbolic cosine of gamma 3, which is this coefficient here in front of uh, k3, then you get what is called the amakov pini equation with a dissipative term, yeah, which is a nonlinear equation, as you can see. Yeah. So there are some solutions, of course, known to this equation. This is uh, in the literature. Um, yeah. Yes. K4 is in the ansatz of the eta, and there is a gamma 4. In the Hamiltonian, there is no K4, but we need the closed algebra. Yeah. And you see here, um, in eta, there, there has to be a K4. Yeah. So the principle is, whatever generators you have in the Hamiltonian, in your eta, there might be more. Yeah? So your eta, that's why I don't like the ten-dimensional one. Yeah? There are also only three terms, but it doesn't close only after if you have ten generators. So here you would have uh, a product from one to ten, and that makes it a lot harder technically. Conceptually, it's just the same. Yes. The spectrum, here it is. But in this time independent, this time independent. Are well, there are integers? Yes. Well, we, are, have, we have moved on to the time-dependent case. I will get extra time, no, for this. No? No? <laughs> yes? 
what is your question? You relate, you're asking a question to the time independent case? What is your question? Spectrum. Yes, which spectrum? Which spectrum? Time independent or time dependent? This capital H has a spectrum, right? Yeah, capital H of T. I mean, that spectrum, the, sp the spectrum, okay, I'm not there yet. Yeah, I haven't gone. Yeah. So, but, but this is a time dependent. What do you mean by spectrum? This is a time dependent scenario. Yes? Yeah, but this is time independent. Are you talking now time dependent or time independent? Those are eigenvalues of what? Aren't they the eigenvalues? These are the eigenvalues of the time independent case. Yeah? This is the eigenvalues of this time independent Hamilton. So we are now smoothly moving to discussion. Yeah, I've part. moved on to the time dependent scenario here. Yeah? Okay, so that's, the, that's really the key. That was to, the other one was just an introduction to show that system is not well-defined. Yeah? And now this system becomes well-defined if I switch on time in these coefficients. Yeah? So we have to solve technically this equation, yeah? and um, we can bypass that. Yeah? So here's another method yeah, one can use, and that's called the method of Lewis Riesenfeld invariance. Yeah? which is well-defined for Hermitian um, Hamiltonians. Yeah, you have to solve uh, this equation. Yeah? And um, in this case, we solve it for two systems, for the Hermitian and the non-Hermitian one. And what is beautiful is these invariants are also pseudo-Hermitian. Yeah? So in a way, uh, this becomes easier if you have solved. Um, it's, of course, equivalent. Yeah, it just gives the same answer yeah? if you solve first uh, this system. Yeah? So these are the key equations you solve. You solve this equation, then you have your invariance. You solve the eigenvalue equation. The eigenvalues in this case, this key here, they are time independent. Yeah? And then um, you get the solution to the time dependent Schrödinger equation by finding this phase, and you find the phase from this equation. Yeah? So this you can do now. For IH, Hermitian, I capital H, which is non-Hermitian, and then we solve this equation. So somehow, solving the time-dependent Dyson equation is sort of chopped into three pieces. Yeah? And it turns out, this makes it a lot easier. Yeah? So let's try this. So here is an ansatz for IH, the non-Hermitian invariant, the Hermitian one and the emission Hamiltonian here with the coefficients. Yeah? This is non-emission, so these coefficients have to be complex. Yeah? And doing this, I will not go through the technicalities. Here are the solutions for gamma 3 and gamma 4. Yeah? So, and using this, um, the, the chi, which was the solution of the amicov pini equation, is just the hyperbolic cosine of gamma 3, and we get this, and you can plug this into the amicov pini equation, and of course, it is a solution. Yeah? But you see, doing this, we have never solved an amicov pini equation. Yeah? It has been bypassed, so this is easier. Yeah? So in a way, it's like um, uh, people who, who know about integrable systems, yeah? and we have a talk, uh, the last talk today, by Julia Sen will, will, will show this, there's also a standard procedure when you have equations, you separate them into two linear differential equations. And in a way, this is what happened here. You know, we have separated our system into two linear equations, you know, and then we just relate them. You know? So that makes it a lot easier um, to solve. You know, it's more lengthy because you have to do all these steps. You know? But very often for complicated systems, um, the direct solution of the Dyson equation is really very hard. Yeah? So these are the technicalities, and I will promote this one as the best method to, to use. Yeah? And I'm not sure, Professor Mamashe, you will be talking about this maybe? Yeah, so we will hear more about this, I guess. So here is the solution, and we have not solved any um, amakov pini equation. Uh, we just get the solution here for free. Yeah? And um, so just to complete, then we have our um, Hermitian Hamiltonian, and these coefficients now is just the decoupled two uh, harmonic oscillators, and here are the, the coefficients. Yeah. And these are just 
constant of integrations, and the Q1 has to be smaller one, modulus. Yeah. So that's a way to solve this. Yeah. Now let's move on and solve all. Yes, yes. The solutions are not unique. Yes. yes. And I'm wondering, maybe they correspond to different physics or no? Well, that's not a new question in the time-dependent scenario. That's the same in the time-independent scenario. The etas and the rows are not unique. Yeah. I, I, I believe this is an open question. Yeah. This is a class of systems, but there's a, a nice result by Gaia, Scholes, and Hane. If you fix one more operator, and then it becomes unique. Yeah. So in a way, it's the same in the emission case. Yeah. Um, if you fix another operator, but there's more obvious, you fix your x, and x is your um, uh, operator. I said observable, I mean, of course. Yeah. If you fix one more observable, then it becomes unique. Yeah. So we want, of course, to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So just to complete, yeah, so here is um, the solution for this is, remember, the K1 was just the um, uh, harmonic oscillator. This is known, but we have now a coupled system, but this we can take from the literature and then just translate. And you see here, somehow the amokov pini equation has reappeared, you know, somehow, but on a completely different level, you know, on a completely different place. Now we are calculating the wave functions before we calculated the eta. You know, so we could avoid it, but eventually it comes back. You know? But we have a solution, you know, and um, using this, so this was not calculated in these papers, you can calculate all the expectation values. And um, how much time do I have? Zero, okay. But there were lots of questions. So, um, so I, I speed up a little. So this this term, and it's nicely, it's, so this is, this is time dependent, these eaters, yeah. Um, but we can easily show, um, I speed up a bit, that this is in fact time independent, because if you look at this, you get again the Emakov Pini equation, and this is just zero, yeah. So we have solved the entire system for this case, yeah. We have all the metric, we have the eaters, we have uh, the solutions to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So what this system, it's a nice example where you can really complete the entire program. And crucially also, we are in a regime where the time independent um, um, scenario is meaningless. Yeah? So here, um, uh, and, and we can then calculate instantaneous eigen energies, of course. Yeah? It's just plugging this all in. Yeah? So, um, how to how to explain this, and then that was the reason I also presented this 2D case. Yeah. Is there so these energies are now real, which I calculated here. Yeah. So is there a PT symmetry? Is there a time-dependent PT symmetry now that explains that? And yes, there is, and it's easy to show for the 2D model. Yeah. So here's our 2D model. Here is now again the Hamiltonian, just repeated. Here was the emission Hamiltonian. And we could calculate also the energy operator in this case, yeah, um, which is real. Here it is in this case. Yeah. Now, is there a PT operator? Well, let's try to solve it. Yeah. If it's real, maybe we can just find it. Yeah. So it has to be antilinear. There has to be some conjugation involved. So we solve this commutation relation. We know it has to be the eigenstates of H tilde have to be eigenstates of PT, possibly with a phase. And we want it to be an involution. If we square, then it has to be one. Yeah? And indeed, you can solve these equations, and here's the solution. Yeah? So here's the solution, and it's a time-dependent um, PT operator. These quantities now, these coefficients, um, can now be time-dependent. Yeah? So there is an explanation, um, and there are now all kinds of fancy time-dependent uh, PT symmetries appearing. And so I conclude now. Um, so there are various, it's not the conclusion yet, various systems which have been solved yet. Yeah? Um, uh, so there's the Swanson model, which is the standard one you look at that has been solved for the time-dependent case. Um, the one side young lee lattice model I explained to you, you can do it for higher spins as well. I showed you the 2D case, and we have a general Lie algebraic Hamiltonian, and this is 
um, to appear very soon. Yeah? So my conclusions are, so um, non-Hermitian quantum mechanical systems with a time-dependent metric are certainly um, consistent, yeah? and they can be solved. And you just have to give up now this dual nature of the Hamiltonian. Yeah? So the Dyson equation can be solved, and when I mean it can be solved, you can solve it in different ways. You can solve, uh, solve it indirectly using uh, Louis Riesenfeld invariance, or you could solve um, the quasi hermeticity relation. You know? And this I already said, H still satisfies the time-dependent Schrödinger equation, but it is no longer an observable. You know? And instantaneous energies, they can be real, I showed you, even though in the time-independent case, they are not. We, are, we can make sense now of the broken PT regime, and um, I even showed you um, a time-dependent PT operator, which ensures this property. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and the metric representation with was this spe uh, special case, where H of T is time-dependent, but capital H is not, can be used to solve interesting emission time-dependent systems. Yeah. And if you want to see more details, which I left out, um, you can see Tom's poster in the poster session. Yeah. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. So thanks for the night. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have minus one minute for discussion, so I suggest that it will be um, postponed to um, other days and coffee breaks because next speaker is waiting. And there was, was a lot of questions during the talk, so that's those five minutes which were spent for these answers. So thanks to the speaker again for the answers to the questions.